This week on Georgia Traveler, we journey to the Coca-Cola Space Science Center in Columbus where you can explore Mars and land a space shuttle without ever leaving Earth. We're then off to White Georgia to the world's largest old car junkyard. I mean, you don't see cars made like this anymore. Look at the grills, look at the lights, look at the workmanship and the craft. It's acres and acres of iconic automobiles and a unique pint-sized art collection at Old Car City, USA. It's burger time at Holman and Finch in Atlanta. People plan hours ahead and journey for miles for a chance of devouring a burger that's been called the world's best. What is our cheeseburger? Right. What's the American icon? Right. How can I express America? And it's time to explore the beautiful downtown streets and poetic marshes of Glen County during our visit to Brunswick, an old coastal town with three classic B&Bs. You get a feeling of community. You get a feeling of what this place is that is Brunswick, Georgia, and who the people are, and, and we welcome everybody. All that and more on the next Georgia Traveler. begin this week's journey in Columbus at the Coca-Cola Space Science Center, where you can launch a mission to Mars and explore outer space. Space. Ever since man began sending objects beyond Earth's atmosphere, the idea of space exploration became a reality. Children and adults the world over have since dreamed of being a part of space exploration. And fortunately, there are places like the Columbus State University Coca-Cola Space Science Center where these dreams can be discovered. We have tried to develop the exhibit in our exhibit gallery to be as hands-on and immersive and interactive as possible. Some kids are playing on the wave display back there, I hear it going, but we also have our flight simulators where you can actually jump in these flight simulators and it's a game where you can find each other in the game so you can line up four people and see who the top gun is. And In addition to that, we have our shuttle lander where you can practice landing the space shuttle. Talk to me, Goose. Where are we? Uh-oh. You're down and locked in that water. 270. Okay, everybody. There's the Mars Rover game. These trucks aren't actual replicas of the current Mars Rover, but are more practical in this environment. You can load Martian rocks onto your space vessel or simply crash into the other Mars Rovers. So here you can kind of take a timeline journey from the beginnings of space exploration, going to things that happened in more recent years. The explosion of Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986 shook the nation, but the families of the Challenger victims launched a push to open Challenger Discovery Centers like this one in Columbus to reclaim young minds and their interest in space exploration. The families of the crew of the Challenger Space Shuttle wanted a living memorial, a living legacy to their loved ones. They, they wanted the mission to continue, and what they came up with was the concept of simulated space missions where students could come and for a couple of hours experience what it was like to go through astronaut training. And that's kind of how the Challenger Centers were founded. Larger groups coming through, adults and children, can sign up for the Challenger Center Adventures, where its director, Scott Norman, trains and advises actual simulated missions. Well, this is great. I mean, I guess we're starting here. This is right. This is control. Right, this is our replica of Mission Control. And if you've ever seen pictures of the real Mission Control in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. you'll notice it looks very similar. You right. see similar consoles. This, uh, of course, is our navigation console. There are different missions, different scenarios that we can do. A typical mission is about two hours. Okay. So that includes a pre-mission briefing, the time that they're actually in the simulator, and the post-mission debrief. So if we so, could get to Mars in two hours, a lot more people would be doing it. Uh, yes, exactly. In reality, <laughs> you know, to travel to Mars is between six and 12 months. Gotcha. You saw the movie Apollo 13, yeah. you know, the guys on the ground mm -hmm. had to come up with the, uh, the solutions to the problems. And it's the same way. One of my favorite emergencies I'll show you is our oxygen emergency. And there's, there's several things that could cause this to happen. So we have oxygen warning. So we've got to go to red alert. 
You don't really cut off the oxygen, though. Oh, well, not. It's, it is a simulation. <laughs> okay, but you can good. imagine how excited sixth graders get when this happens. The Challenger Project was actually the beginning of this whole center. In fact, its success inspired a flurry of ideas, developing a foundation for the Coca-Cola Space Science Center. The Challenger Learning Center was uh, established as the founding idea, and then from that, the rest of the facilities that we have here at the Space Science Center kind of grew out of that idea. So we, somebody said, hey, what if we added a planetarium to that? And what if we added on an observatory that did astronomical events? And what if it had a lobby that had space-related displays in the lobby? So all of that uh, kind of grew out of that and now we have our exhibit gallery, we have our meat observatory, and we have our atmosphere theater planetarium. State-of-the-art facilities added on to the Challenger Center was the intention and, it is safe to say, mission accomplished. And from a mission to Mars to an observatory where you can actually see Mars, this massive high-powered telescope records images directly to the computer. My visit was during the daytime, so solar activity was the catch of the day. Now, I know the sun looks a certain color to us, but what color is this? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. The sun is actually green, which is true from a certain point of view. Okay. Essentially, most of the sun's light is coming out in the green part of the spectrum. The thing is, it's also giving out light in the blue part and the red part, and when you combine them all together, it gives us the yellowish-white color that we're familiar with in our daytime sky. All kinds of scientific displays are scattered throughout the center. Some explain light spectrums and infrared, others educate on the wonders of the universe. This is actually a birthplace for stars, so these, all of these little regions that are very hot right here are where brand new baby stars are being formed in the heart of that nebula. Human space exploration through NASA is currently in a holding pattern. The space shuttle program was discontinued in 2011. However, the Coca-Cola Space Science Center has been lucky enough to acquire shuttle program artifacts, including one of the actual shuttle main engine nozzles that went into space nine times on four of the five spacecrafts. And so it's got a tremendous amount of history attached to that one piece. Pieces of that nozzle were actually forged right here, and so it's got a Columbus tie to it, and we're very, very happy to welcome those pieces home with this entire nozzle. So folks need to come down and check out that nozzle in our lobby. For so many years, American children were very inspired to become NASA scientists and engineers. And now, even though the shuttle program has ended, there are new initiatives like NASA's SLS, Space Launch System, and even privately funded programs that will continue driving children to places like the Columbus State Coca-Cola Space Science Center to stimulate their young minds. Let's now kick it into high gear at Old Car City, USA in White, Georgia, the world's largest old car junkyard with a few restored automotive gems. Whether you're a classic car enthusiast or a gearhead, everyone agrees that cars are art. And beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder at Old Car City, USA, the world's largest known old car junkyard. If your average old car junkyard is where hunks of junk go to die, then Old Car City is where aging beauties go to be reborn. This junkyard jungle in White, Georgia has more than 4,000 vehicles scattered over 34 acres. We call it art, nature, and history, yep. So what's happened with this car Dean here? Lewis inherited the family business from his dad 30 years ago. I remember when I had like two or three cars and I kept accumulating. And then, and then several years later, I got thinking, you know, one day these cars are gonna be real rare and it's gonna be a show place rather than a sales place. And that's really what it turned into. A show place where Mother Nature now has a starring role intertwining her tapestry of vines and embroidered cloaks of leaves among the rust and the chrome. And it grabbed hold of the bumper right here. It's literally embedded it's in embedded. the tree. It's embedded in the tree and grew up. Look at that. It's become a part of the tree. What do you think your dad would say if he saw that now? Oh, he'd be amazed. He wouldn't say much, but he'd be amazed. I don't know how long this has been sitting here, but it's probably been 40 plus years. See the way the tree grew through it? So that tree must be 30 to 40 years old. And nature has also changed the course of the business over the years. It used to be a prime location to scoop up rare parts for classic cars. 
This is my motor division. And, motor division yeah, of Old Car City. And I got transmission division on up the street. <laughs> And car lovers can venture inside the Old Car City Museum, where Dean showcases his personal collection of classic cars, including Elvis Presley's last known ride, a 1977 Lincoln Continental. The museum and miles of trails can be toured throughout the week. Old Car City's primary source of revenue comes from photographers who travel here from all over the world. Probably the workmanship, the craft, the history of the American automaker. You know, Plymouth, really, that's a name you don't see anymore. It's a little bit of Americana and lots of history. Photographer Bonnie Murray is seduced by the timeless beauty here that can be captured so effortlessly. I mean, you don't see cars made like this anymore. Look at the grills, look at the lights, look at the workmanship and the craft. The lines, the circles, you know, very geometric, but beautiful. What do you think is different now about cars today? It's just, there's not, the lines are different. They're not as, in my opinion, they're just not as sexy as they were back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Well, they're plastic now where they was heavy metal. Look at that car. You don't get any, anything now with metal with gauges like this. That's a gauge there. And the older they are, the, the thicker the gauge is. I got six six model, but your fifties and forties even thicker gauge. They're heavy metal, no plastic, almost no plastic. Heavy metal is always better. Heavy metal. Dean takes us on a winding tour through Cadillac graveyards and bootleg history. Turns out Bartow County was a hub for transporting illegal moonshine during Prohibition. We stop at this old 1944 deluxe coupe. What they do is uh, stiffen the springs and all up and make it heavy. I mean, make it where it holds low and they load it down in the trunk and, you know, it would look suspicious because it had heavy duty springs and shocks and all this. And they'd take off and that was a fast car back then. If the trails of Old Car City could talk, what tales they would tell. Just ask Dean's son, Jeff, who grew up in a boy's paradise. Every now and then in those days, some of these cars would actually crank and run. And we found an old Dodge Dart. And we got that Dodge Dart out and started racing it through these aisles here, playing demolition <laughs> derby and racing and hitting things. Oh, it was great fun, but until he caught us and then all the fun stopped. Then there was no more demolition derby. Not for a while that he knew about. <laughs> but Dean is more than just a car guy and a trailblazer of rusted Americana. He's also an artist with the most unusual medium. I, I usually do different things anyway, so there was a cut and I started drawing on it. I can't remember, but it, it, it was different. Nobody did it. I've never seen anybody else do this, so uh, I started drawing on cups. Upstairs at the Old Car City Museum is a gallery with hundreds of Dean's styrofoam works of art decorated with his favorite themes. And of course, this is describing art, nature, history, and Old Car City, USA, all American. And then that's another one, Old Car City. Look at the shading that you've done. Yeah, it blends in. Well, here's a good one. That 1956 Cadillac. And I have a, that on That's the, the grill and that, the headlights? Yeah. The bumper, the headlight, the fender, and the hood goes on out of sight, and then the grill, you know. Here's like a like a junkyard. See the cars lined up. I wonder where you got that idea. I don't know. <laughs> so take some time to just drink it in, from the cups to the caddies, and let the trails take you through nature's wildest car imagination. It's cheeseburger time at Holman and Finch in Atlanta. Let's join Chef Marvin Woods at this highly acclaimed restaurant that's home to the country's best burger. James Beard Award winning Atlanta chef Linton Hopkins is never far from his other restaurant. He has two of them, and they're literally across the driveway from each other. They're named after his grandfather, Eugene Holman. Who's Finch? Finch is my partner, Greg Best's maternal grandfather. Why did you decide to do your restaurant in Atlanta? It's home, right. and it's where I have, want to raise my kids. Mm -hmm. It's where my family is, mm -hmm. and 
I want to be impactful here. I really believe in being in Atlanta. Having practiced his art in New Orleans and Washington, Chef Linton came home and opened Restaurant Eugene in 2004. It's based on the principles of freshness, seasonality, and strong Southern roots. Southern cuisine to me is not a, a period of time. It's forever, with a past, a now, and a future. You got it, I like and that. Restaurant Eugene was an immediate success, winning numerous national honors, a Best New Chef Award for Chef Linton and Devoted Diners. Four years later, in 2008, he opened Holman and Finch Public House. In terms of menu, mm -hmm. do you feel like um, having Holman and Finch completes you because you do different things here than you do at Restaurant Eugene? Oh, absolutely. Now, if we're eating animals, mm -hmm. then everything is good. Right. I mean, thank goodness for the cheeseburger in America, because what would we do with all those other parts? Right. Chef Linton has a mighty high opinion of cheeseburgers. What's the American icon? Right. How can I express America? Got it. OK. Yeah. And I don't know anybody who doesn't have a high opinion of his Holman and Finch burgers. The Foodies website, Epicurious numbers it among the best burgers in America. And Atlanta's own Food Network star, Alton Brown, says it's the best flat out burger. We're here for the burger. They only make 24 burgers a night and serve them only at 10 o'clock. This cheeseburger is a lot of effort. So what's in what's in the burger? I'm making the buns every day. Right. I've got a whole bakery that does it. Right. Ketchup and mustard I make, make from scratch. scratch. Pickles from scratch. Yep. The cheese is plain good old Kraft American, and the onions are red. The cucumbers for the bread and butter pickles are from Georgia, and so is the beef. It's a simple recipe, and I'm a freedom of information guy. It's half brisket and chuck. All right, chef, so what's the first steps in making this great burger? The first step is we got to get butter on the bun, and we got to go all the way to the edge, because what happens when this hits the steel on the griddle, mm -hmm. we're going to get this beautiful crispy, edge. Right? All right, the next thing is salt. What kind of salt? Uh, I use kosher salt. Okay. We just pop them right on to the pan. And we're just going to get a little mm -hmm. press down, because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that meat's getting caramelized. Right. All right, so we're going to go into the flipping. Right. Now uh, you can start on that side. We're just okay. going to lay some onions down All right. on uh, half of them. And I'm a double cheese guy. I see. Right, because what happens with the, when we go to stacking right. is this cheese is going to be in between two right. patties. I got it. And it's going to start melting and creating its own sauce. So you'll see all this caramelization here, all the juices starting, the cheese is melting. Yep. Okay, now we can start stacking the stack. And now let's just go to bun. To the buns. So look how awesome that is. And then so if you want to uh, pickle I'll, the I'll, top. Yes. And then we put the ketchup and the mustard on the side. Right. Um, and then we have our fries. Uh, just hand cut, and then we do the double blanch, the right. standard. So you, you have this. Two times. Fry them two times, and then you can get the soft fully cooked potato with a crispy exterior. Mm -hmm. I just want to share a good cheese with Christmas every day. <laughs> oh, yeah, it. so there it is. Well, let's go eat. Mm, amazing. It's good. It's really good, Chef. Taste the beef. You taste the love the and the passion that went into this. So, if they only make 24 cheeseburgers a night, how can you get one? If you're here for the cheeseburger, just let a server know. And what time do you need to be there for that 10 o'clock deadline? Yeah, I would say if you got in around 7.30 or 8 on a weeknight... You stand a good chance. Yeah, you stand a good chance. Or you could do what these folks did. They came to brunch on Sunday when Holman and Fitch make burgers all day, and they believe just like me. It's definitely the best burger I've ever had. Let's now head south to the gorgeous marshes of Glen County in Brunswick, an old coastal town with historic B&Bs mixed with new age charm. A coastal city serving as the gateway to Georgia's Golden Isles. Brunswick, Georgia is a well-planned city on a grid quite similar to its neighbor Savannah, just 80 miles to the north. Ogathorpe, of course, founded the colony of Georgia and came to Brunswick did not lay out Brunswick, as is often told. Brunswick was laid out by General McIntosh in 1771 that copied Oglethorpe's plan in Savannah. So, in a town founded by the British, why the German name? Well, the name Brunswick comes from Braunschweig, Germany, which was the home of the Hanoverian kings 
those kings were married into the British royal family. So as a tribute to the British royal family, when Brunswick was laid out, the name of the streets after British royalty and after the Revolutionary War, the names were never changed back like so many other cities did. So we kept our British heritage here in Brunswick. The city has suffered its share of hardship through the years. The downtown area was consumed by flood during a hurricane in 1898, requiring the town to rebuild. But by the 1940s, the city was on its way back up when the federal government commissioned the building of the Liberty ships for American soldiers in World War II. Over 99 ships built in two years. That's roughly one massive ship every seven days. And in December of 1943, the ship workers gave their labor that day to the war cause. So they built their ships that day for free. At Mary Ross Park, there's a scale model of a Liberty ship. And then also at Liberty Ship Park, which is under the Sydney Lanier Bridge, you can see the ship's ways where the ships were let down into the water when they were completed. And portions of the shipyard are still there. Boating, fishing, and other waterside amenities are an obvious draw of this coastal town, and rightfully so. But Brunswick's cultural scene has also been a draw since the days of poet Sidney Lanier. Where Sidney Lanier, George's greatest poet, wrote the marshes of Glen. He was looking at the beautiful marshes and the sky and the clean water, and it's really kind of almost a religious poem in some aspects. And he was just talking about the beauty of the earth and what it meant to him. Uh, and it's right on Highway 17. If you see older pictures of it, you might not think it's the same tree just because there used to be a creek and the river was right at the foot of the tree. However, Lanier Oak is not the only famous tree in town. Lover's Oak, nestled inland on a neighborhood street, has inspired romance for centuries. The tree is uh, over 900 years old, and legend has it that the young Indian couples would meet there in secret and sit on the low branches of the tree and talk and make their plans. And even today, families take their pictures there, and you'll see young couples sitting on the tree branches because they're so low to the ground. This impressive downtown district is scattered with historic buildings and homes. In fact, there are three beautiful bed and breakfasts where visitors can bunk up for the night in luxurious style. There's McKinnon House, Brunswick Manor, and Waters Hill. They're all in the National Register Old Town District, walking distance from downtown. And all three of them are beautiful places, lovingly restored homes, and offer great hospitality. And hundreds walk these historic streets the first Friday of every month. Shops open up and the town lights up for the festive First Friday celebration. Only rainbows after rain, the sun will always come again. It's great shops and restaurants, um, and there's a, there's a lot of things to do, you know, like the historic theater and the shows that we have. The Ritz was integral to bringing people back because of the events and the exhibits and all those kinds of things that we have. It's been a cornerstone of the downtown Brunswick since it's been here. People come all the time. This is where I had my first kiss. This is my first date. Uh, I met my husband here. You know, it's all those kinds of things. In addition to being, you know, an, an economic engine for the downtown, because when I moved here in the um, late 90s, our downtown was not quite back to how it is now, but the Ritz was integral to bringing people back because of the events and the exhibits and also galleries. I think it's also here, it's very much, you get a feeling of community. You get a feeling of what this place is that is Brunswick, Georgia, and who the people are, and we welcome everybody. It's just about as south as you can get before hitting the Florida line a quaint downtown area sitting along the inspiring Marshes of Glen. That's all for this episode. Until next time, pleasant journeys.
Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.